All right, Mike, with That's Good Enough For Me.com, we're doing our Who's Zoom and Who series. I'm joined today with Drew Conti from the newly reunited I Call Fives and Kyle Kilday, the director of the Last Scene documentary. How are you guys doing? Pretty good. Fantastic. Yes. All right, well, super happy to be here today. Uh, Kyle, I'm going to start with you. I've been following your documentary on Instagram quite a bit. Uh, covering, I, I keep calling it the drive-through records era of pop punk, which isn't entirely accurate as the documentaries expanded further. But I guess if we're talking kind of the date range, uh, would you elaborate a little bit on your documentary? Yeah, it's basically, uh, it's kind of about that wave of uh, kind of like pop punk, uh, emo, skate punk, hardcore, post-hardcore, like just that whole thing, even a little bit of ska. Uh, that was like going on kind of like out there in the, in like VFW halls and uh, you know, like banquet halls and rec, you know, church rec, church, church rec rooms and stuff like that. Um, kind of in like the late nineties, early two thousands, which ended up of course, like breaking out and getting huge and kind of, you know, like culminating with like fall out boy and Mike him um, kind of like in the mid two thousands. So just kind of like that, so it's it's not so much about genre. In fact, I've been I've tried to really kind of stay away from too much, uh, you know, like labeling, right? And especially yeah. the word emo. I've been staying like I've been staying away from the word emo, um, and kind of like taking it kind of interview by interview as far as like how much I. I, I talk about it. Like if I sit down with somebody and they like bust it out first, then like we could use it. But I've, I've been kind of like avoiding the term. Um, cause it's such like a loaded, uh, loaded term for whatever reason. And, um, you know, some of the bands like don't care. Some of the bands, oh, some of the bands, um, you know, uh, you know, like really like kind of like reject it. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, you know, so uh, it's really more about like the the era and kind of like the way they did it and kind of that being, I don't know, like after that, because they kind of had a foot in like the old way of doing it um, like, and, you know, and then a foot in kind of like the digital internet wave, uh, you know, like they were right there for that and kind of how that changed. I mean, it changed everything, but it, but like, you know, like, like in society, but it changed kind of like how bands went about growing fan bases and then it changed the music business a lot. So, uh, so I'm going to kind of like, that's, that's my angle to make it like a little bit, you know, like different from just kind of like a band biography, like, you know, kind of thing. Absolutely. No, and I, I really appreciate what I've seen. Uh, I think that I'm not sure how old you are, but we seem to be kind of admiring the same, uh, 38. Artists from that era. Okay, 36. So I, uh, I, one of my first Zooms was with Adam Lorbach from Homegrown. And by the end of the Zoom, you know, he was like, dude, come on, man. Why do you know so much about my band? <laughs> like, why is this important to you? Uh, and I know that you got to speak with him and, and Johnny, right? Yep. Yeah. I think that you, you did some stuff yeah. with Johnny Tran. And he, uh, he, he read my Instagram message that I sent him at 3 o'clock in the morning. But he hasn't agreed to do one yet, but we'll see. Yeah, he was cool. Uh, uh, now, I did want to bring this up. Uh, you had uh, done some video uh, and covered the starting line show at the Summit in Denver. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to let you know that when you were on that private balcony shooting the video, mm -hmm. and there were those, like, 16 obnoxiously fucked up men and women uh, right by you that kept knocking over your tripod, going to the back bathroom down that stairs mm -hmm. that was my wife and me and my friends from Nebraska <laughs> really? who drove to Denver to go to that show That's so awesome. <laughs> I as, as soon as I started following you on Instagram and you posted the starting line footage I said, oh, that's that really nice guy that we were just horribly annoying the entire <laughs> evening. So, wow, uh, I remember at one point you were, like, you know, because the security guard kept saying, like, don't stop on the staircase. Yeah. And every time we were walking to the bathroom, a uh, starting line would cut into a really good song off of that record. And, of course, we would get yelled at, and then it would start all over again. So, my yeah. apologies. That was a good show. Uh, it was a very good show. And, uh of course, marijuana is not legal in Nebraska, so uh, we were uh, three sheets to the wind. So uh, moving forward, 
as soon as Drew finds out how to use his phone, I'm, I'm I keep trying to move it. I'm, I keep trying to. I'm, I keep trying to properly like set it up, and I'll leave it alone. Hi. Okay. By how the way, you? marijuana that's a drug. I don't condone drug usage. It's just totally. And I'm sorry about all the R R T V is outside of my window. Philadelphia, um, as Donald Trump liked to say, a lot of bad things happen in Philadelphia. And honestly, <laughs> everyone drives on like fucking four wheelers and like dirt bikes. And it's like this like cool kind of thing. Like, I guess this is why I was a virgin until I was 34. Uh, I'm not 34 yet. Um, but no, it's just like, man, I don't, I don't know what's cool about it. But anyway, it's really loud. So ignore that. Oh, uh, no, you're cool. Too bad. There was, uh, I interviewed Todd Kowalski from Propagandy and I was hawing outside of his window time and we were able to kind of EQ it a little bit in post-production. So we should be okay. Uh, let's we'll talk about I call post. fives. <laughs> post. Yes. Leave let's talk about I call sure. fives. Uh, fantastic pop punk band. Uh, came out kind of late in the, in the game uh, with a really good, I think, honest and fresh homage to the genre. Uh, that Kyle and I care about. So I wanted to talk about why you guys decided uh, that you were going to write new music and get back together. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, it, it's funny to hear about like when we just think about like the early two thousands and that drive through era, and like just, the, it was totally reshaped. Right. So whether it was like with my Kevin fallout boy, like there was a total change of just the approach, say from the year 1998, um, with say like an MXPX to, you know, Oh five with like a Mike M. Um, so then kind of coming along for us, we started in 06 and we were actively touring by 2008. So like seeing that whole realm, it was so, it, again, it was just, it was different. Um, you know, we relied on say like MySpace and, and excuse me, and later like Facebook and, and Twitter. Um, but so just a much different era. Like, again, it was just cool to see, like, you know, whether it's Newfound Glory or the starting line or Midtown or really you can name it. Like a lot of those bands then had this opportunity to do these major label releases in the mid early 2000s. Um, when we came around that, that again, that that objectively was gone because uh, they all fucking blew it. No. Um, but like that sort of thing just wasn't a thing anymore. Um, so for us, it just became kind of going back to, hey, we, we're just going to throw all the time. We're going to just try and write the best songs we can write. Um, so not unlike the question you, you just had posed um, like years ago. And I remember if we were just pitching a label, I'd be like, well, why I call fives? Like, what do you guys do differently? Um, and like, as a younger guy, I, I genuinely just thought like, well, we, we like to practice and our singer can sing pretty good. Like, isn't that what, what more do we need here? Jesus Christ. Like I've heard a lot of bad stuff. I don't know. I, I assume that was suffice. Um, but it turned out like, in something that, that we'll all admittedly say, like we didn't quite ever really hit the, the nail on the head. Um, there's like a connection aspect. Um, and that's why I think that we're, you know, even to have this discussion about say the new founds of the world or, or dashboard or, or Kyle, you had mentioned uh, Juliana theory earlier. Uh, awesome fucking band. I saw them with Zayo uh, at the Trocadero. It was the weirdest tour ever. Um, but like these bands, I, I do feel like they were able to like kind of more meaningfully grab onto something. Whereas like with us, say 12 years ago, I think we were more of just like, man, we really like Newfound Glory in the starting line. Um, and our singer can sing. And again, that was cool. But, and that offered us a, a, a ton of cool opportunities. Um, we opened for Green Day in Australia. We were on the Warp Tour. Like just, again, I could have never guessed or been able to just tell folks like, man, we did this and this was great. Um, but so now years later, so it's been eight years since new music. And I, I think the lingering thing amongst myself and Jeff, our singer, um, it was just like, man, like, I think we, 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 we sort of miss, miss swung a little bit. Um, I, I think that there's an approach where we can be more honest in our songwriting. Um, and we can kind of, you know, even though we're not, you know, we're not going to be a full-time touring band, we're not able to do what we did, you know, 12 years ago, we'll, we'll just play to eight people and we'll play, 40 shows in 50 days. Like that's, I think we misconstrued that for, um, for being honest. Like, so we were, what I'm saying is we were honest in our approach at it for sure. But I, I think in terms of songwriting, um, we were quick to just sort of stick to this certain sound, which we appreciate and enjoy. And, and, and we certainly still sound like, but I think we failed to match the content in a way that was just genuine and relatable. Um, 
and that's what I think is just interesting now. Like talk about say like the, like you know if, if you were to ask me about say self titled Newfound Glory, um, just a relatable fucking record that like I can tell you about the first time that I heard Hit or Miss and how I felt. Um, and and I'm not discrediting my band songs, but I'm just saying that that what what really brought us back to doing this was sort of l- looking back and realizing. Um, okay, yeah, Jeff can sing and we can play fine pop punk music, but how do we, you know, this many years later, how do we make the best songs that maybe we should have done way back when? And for other reasons, personal or or not, uh, we just weren't able to. Um, Whether, again, like with label stuff or touring stuff, financial stuff, I mean, they were all crucial, especially for like a young man, you know, from ages 22 to 26. That's a weird time to make not enough money monthly to pay your phone bill. Um, so I think what we thought we were supposed to write and, and what we had written, um, you know, it, it just didn't quite hit the mark that, that now we've been working towards. So very long story short. So to answer your question, though, I, I just think eight years later, uh, now we're all in our early thirties. Some of the guys have kids. I just think we're, we've been able to approach this in a much more, um, honest lens. And, and that's been really cool and fulfilling. Like as fr- like even like revisiting and I know I'm getting deep here, but like revisiting friendship, I'm like mm-hmm. when you, when you eliminate that element of pressure and label stuff, and again, all those other, uh, you know, extracurricular things, um, it allows you to really kind of to, to peel it back and, and write the best I think you're capable of. And, and we've had that opportunity. So, that's that's why we got back together it was just we knew yeah man like now we can really like we're not thinking like man we're gonna write this one song and this is gonna be it because you know the, everyone's sort of already hitting whatever it is for their life you know as as an as an i like to say adult not an adult um but as adults you know like they've got kids everybody's got careers and now it's just like use this as an opportunity to just do your best and, and have a good time doing it so that's why we're back and I gave you a very long, expl- a long-winded explanation, but uh, I appreciate the question. I was happy to answer it. So, yeah, no, for sure. And I'm gonna. I, I think Kyle may have heard your band for the first time when I sent you that link. Kyle, is that true? I'm so sorry, Kyle. I mean, maybe. <laughs> if I'm being honest, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, no, and you're cool. No, I'm, I mean, so- like, I, I'm sorry to you. I'm a good I like to listen. No, like, uh, it's funny, like, I heard somebody was, like, uh, it was, like, Gabe Saporta, I think it was, who said something, like, uh, I interviewed him, and he was, like, um, you know, but, like, you know, like, they were, like, five years older than us, and, you know, if you think about it, like, that's that's almost, like, a different generation, if you think about, like, high school, right? Um, so, by, like, 2006, mm-hmm. uh, I guess I wasn't really looking for any more, like, new new music, you know what I mean? Like, in the scene i kind of like no and that's that yeah no that's so, fantastic because that that's exactly my point i, I want to give drew a yeah. little bit and his band a little bit more credit here because yeah we're talking uh oh eight or oh nine something like that yeah. uh i'm in between tours i'm i'm pretty much you know done hopping in a van for days <laughs> at a time at this point in my life i just hadn't admitted it yet but uh I'm living with, uh, I guess he was my, my merch guy in my old band. Uh, we're drinking. He busts in my room at like 3.30 in the morning uh, with his laptop, and he has I Call Fives on Bandcamp. And he says, dude, check out this band. And Kyle, same exact mindset. I'm just like, oh, it's a pop punk band with three words in their band name. Like, I, I don't care. <laughs> Seriously. And uh, he, he just said, hey, how many times have I forced you to listen to new music? And I said, okay, touche, but get the fuck out of my room because it's three in the morning. I'll, I'll listen to this by myself. <laughs> and so I did. And I put on your first EP, which was uh, First Things First. Yeah. I, uh, and it was with your original singer, but I put it on and I sent you an email via Bandcamp at like three thirty, four o'clock in the morning. And I think the subject said, oh my God, you guys don't suck. And it was like <laughs> this really awesome moment for me because that's what it was like to go th- from that drive through era and Kyle I'll, I'll kind of have you kind of take off from here uh, but the drive through era picked up my space as far as I'm concerned completely bloated uh, any punk music community in every 
area of our country. Uh, and now suddenly there's these guys with uh, like pop punks, not dead shirts playing just droned, horrible, just basic music, just auto tune maxed drums are triggered. Songwriting is completely out, out the window. And drew, I, I really think that I call fives is one of the only bands in that time period that actually put out music. That's still listenable today. And that still stacks Thank up. Thank you. No, the, it's, the shit that we grew up listening to. The idea, though, again, was it, our emphasis was, was just always to practice. And I, it was just funny, like, meeting so many people, even in that era, where, like, practicing was, like, secondhand. Uh, and it's even more visible today. Like, practice is probably number three or four on the list. Like, there are so many other things now. You know, and I'm not discrediting social media. Social media is a great tool. Um, but I think, you know, when you just break down to, like, the core of it, again, like, a good singer and, and a practicing band, I still mm -hmm. believe goes a long way. Um, well, near the, end of, near the end of the tours that you guys were doing, I know that you're playing with bands where that band's priority was that they had a live auto-tune and their singer had like really pretty weird mullet hair. And that was the band's like entire mission. The songwriting was like third place compared to... I, just, I wanted to be the prettiest girl in the room. It just didn't work out that way. Um, so all I could do was try my best in my, in my own skill set. Um, that's great. But man, if I could have had that great hair, I would have, it would have been me, but and it, maybe but, in another life. But Kyle, I, I kind of want, you know, your documentary honors this amazing, uh, boom in music, uh, pop punk exploding everywhere. And then really some of the best parts of the genre, in my opinion, but I kind of want to talk more about, uh, the Armageddon that followed. Sure. Yeah. The death of that awesome sound. Yeah. I mean, well, what's funny is, um, the consensus seems to be maybe like 2007 is when mm -hmm. kind of like, like around that time, uh, where like this, this wave had kind of, had kind of crested. Um, and then we had a lot of like copycat bands, kind of going on and and then and then things kind of changed like it started to shift it seemed like um as far as like the scene goes it kind of like started to shift more into like that that like metalcore type thing you know what i mean exactly yeah um and that and then it you know and then because uh like screamo when i call it that um had kind of kind of had like its little moment maybe like oh four to like around then right with like hawthorne mm -hmm. heights senses fail um who else would be considered a screamo band i mean like uh, uh, silverstein uh, yeah silverstein sure uh but a bunch, yeah. uh, but kyle i, I do want to ask and not to cut you off i'm also curious though in, in, in how we define though the separation of the two right because mm -hmm. there's a ton of folks that if you had said like Hey, what does Census Fail? I even think Census Fail, fuck you, Philadelphia. I even think Census Fail at a time <laughs> might have been like, oh, we're pop punk. So yeah. I just think it's always been a very sure. thin line between, in, in that realm. Sorry to cut you off. No, yeah. Well, it's because like screaming, because like a lot of these, these bands grew up like listening to hardcore and, uh, and like post hardcore, you know, kind of thing. And like, scream it you know and there was like a screamo scene kind of in like the late 90s too where you know like like Seisha, you know for example kind of thing and like bands like that where if you asked me what screamo is i would probably say that and then uh i don't know like something that i've been trying to get people to talk about was how it you know i mean i've like asked a lot of the bands who feature screaming like Silverstein, because I interviewed Shane from Silverstein, Buddy from Senses Fail. Um, who else does Screaming that I interviewed? I don't know. Those are the only, the, like, the most prominent. Oh, uh, JT. Well, he didn't scream, but um, uh, Casey screamed, rest in peace. Um, but, like, uh, I interviewed a few of those bands who would be kind of identified as, like, emo, screamo, right? Like, that was when also like emo kind of like just started to be used as a term to kind of like describe the whole thing. Right. Um, there were like a few terms, right. There was like emo just became kind of like a catch all thing. 
uh, like warp tour band became like another thing. You know, I remember like people saying like, Oh, you know, like they're like a warp tour band. Right. Um, because around like Oh two going back a little bit going around like Oh two that like, I had like kind of like a beat, like a story beat in the doc about how Oh two was the year that kind of like this scene kind of like took over warp tour. Um, like officially. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, like there's that like awesome, awesome clip of, uh, uh, Alkaline Trio playing radio with like Chris number two and it comes out and like, you know, like, and sings it. And, uh, it was like, just like, you know, this iconic thing. Uh, I don't, I don't know if Newfound Glory played Warped Tour that year. I think they did. They must. Yeah, they did. They played Warped Tour that year. So like all these, like, ba- like a lot of these bands ended up on Warped Tour. That was, that was the year the, dr- the, the, uh, drive through stage was on Warped Tour that year. Oh, two. Sure. So like starting line, uh, movie life. What a uh, silly stage. Um, like what a stage. Yeah. And also then yeah. to add on like early so November Finch would fall into that. Finch. I guess there's Finch is another uh, one. Yeah, too. Yeah. And I guess like, but this is where also like that crossover gets weird because like in certain circles, you could say glass draw. Mm-hmm. I certainly wouldn't say they're pop punk at all, but like it still no. dances in that realm. Um, but whereas I would say Thursday is more of an emo band. However, if they're, you know, if there's not a Thursday, there might not be like a census fail or, Oh, story of the year. There's plenty of these bands. Um, yeah. Story of the year. I think though, in, in this particular sect of yeah. pop punk that, that we like into, um, I honestly started to think that it just became this, like, dare I say like, Oh, like we like hardcore. Just, if you didn't know, like we're not all pop over this way. So like, I always got that mm-hmm. vibe with, and not to just like, of course, I love Newfound Glory, and I don't know Chad or, or Pete Wentz from Fall Out Boy, and I appreciate those dudes, but, like, I always got this vibe, and it was just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You guys know we like hardcore, right? Um, and yeah, I think that that was sort of like this. Like there was, thing. Yeah, and, like, I, I think, and particularly Newfound really indulged with this. Like, they've, they've literally cited uh, Toby from H2O, and, like, they've made a point to mm. say, like, hey, we like hardcore. Pete Wentz did it also, like, He's literally screaming. Like, so when we say scream, you know, it's different from like a traditional hardcore yell. Pete Wentz is screaming in the back of, I want to say Saturday, like, yeah, like a death scream. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not, you know, not the most traditional of vocals. And I, I believe he played with, I want to say like, was it race trader or something? Like he played with, with some Chicago hardcore band. And I, I, uh, my point being, I think that because pop punk in the, you know, in the realm that we're speaking in, it relies more on pop. I have mm-hmm. found at least that the folks that I looked up to, um, I always noticed that they wanted to much more liken it to the hardcore side of things. Simply, like, whoa, 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 guys. Look, I like Fred Perry and I yell. And, and that's, yeah, I, again. I, I always, I always kind of chalked it up. I mean, this was always the scenario that I made in my head, right? It was like, you take that really good drive through documentary. There's a, there's a scene where uh, Homegrown is playing I'll Never Fall in Love Again in this giant gymnasium, right? It's this huge fucking circle pit. And uh, Darren's playing the song twice as fast on the record. So just this great moment as, he, as a huge Homegrown fan. I always had this thought of afterwards, right? The show is probably out at like 8 p.m. And so let's say uh, the singer from Finch, uh, Johnny Tran from Homegrown, and uh, Kenny Vasoli are all at a bar, <laughs> drinking after the show and some people come up and they're like, Hey, are you guys in a band or something? And they say, uh, you know, they say the names of their bands and they, Oh yeah. Yeah. I think uh, my little 16 year old brother listens to you guys. You guys are, you guys play pop punk. Right. And so I always kind of took that imaginary scenario and said like, that's what say hello to sunshine is. That's what based on a true story, uh, opening up with such darkness and this kind of forced, uh, and that last homegrown EP was pretty uh, mature as well. They tried kind to of force it in, in, in some places. I think that, that was really, it was like, sure. you play this. Yeah, you, you play the kick ass show every night. And then afterwards, you're like, oh, you guys are a kid band. And so I think that that's kind of what drove all of these bands to really try to refine their sound that I don't personally think they really needed to refine just to prove that they played grown up music or that they had songs that had screaming in them or something, or like slit your wrist lyrics, you know? Right. And that was kind of the, the next step. Yeah. 
Well, my, but, Mike, I would say that the only thing um, aside from that, because totally, I think it, not to use the the, the word that line, <laughs> that rhymes with wussy. Um, I feel like that was always tied to like oh, <laughs> pop punks for wussy. No, it's too. You know, I always liken it to like you know, picture like going to War Tour in O two, and you're like, man, I can't wait to see like Rufio. There was someone in 2002 who was yeah. like, Rufio's not pop punk. No effects is pop punk. You know, so like that was always yes. going to exist. Um, but I think the bigger thing that was like the real changer of just the game and the scene. And that's why, Kyle, I think it's interesting the, the era that you brought up. Because that's post pretty much failure major label debut for those bands. So all those headlining pop punk bands are coming off essentially failed major label releases. I mean, I, I, I couldn't think of, cause I, I can't include Paramore or fall up in this discussion. So if we look at the newfound mid midtown starting line, um, mm-hmm. and then there was a handful of bands that were just straight up given major label deals. It didn't happen. Um, you can add acceptance to that list. Um, so many of them it just didn't work. Like they were supposed to be the, Hey, these, they're going to be the next, uh, you know, and I don't know who that was in 04, like the, the next OK Go or something, or Jet. I, I don't know who they were being, you know, comp to. Uh, or, no, honestly, it would be like the next Sum 41. Um, none of them actually made that work. And, and actually, then when I think further, like, so Valencia even had that opportunity a couple of years later. Same mm-hmm. thing happened. I mean, actually, I do think Rufio had a major label at the end, right? But they were like point islands, being... Maybe? I believe so. Yeah. The, uh, it wasn't an Island Def Jam maybe, but um, I think it just, the, we had this, this weird reality where, and I actually have a strange ability. To, so it, I, I related to hair metal a lot. So my, uh, my, I never met the fucking guy. The only musician in my family, uh, he was the drummer for a band called Cinderella, the Sadie's uh, really? glam rock band. Yeah. And uh, and sadly, he died in a fucking car crash before I ever met his ass. Selfish cocksucker. But I kind of liken this this that that period to them. Like and a, like, imagine being a, a a glam rock band in 1991. When you're like, oh shit, like that fucking Nirvana's coming up. Like I imagine that's what like I'm sure they weren't really, but like that's what I could envision. You know, a 2006 pop punk band saying about like Metro Station. Because it was totally about to be the changing of the oh, of, course. of that yeah. realm. Um, but no, I, I, I just have to admit that I think that they came up short. And at the same time, all the staple bands, whether so Blink was on a hiatus, Good Charlotte was not putting out the records that, you know, you kind of hope to see them follow up with. Um, Fall Boy was doing great, but like there's, and Panic was just starting, but like there wasn't really, and like the staple what was green? I don't. What was Green Day doing? I'm like oh, eight. I don't. I don't know. Um, I Were think they that Broadway. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. That's so my idiot. point. Is I think that <laughs> yeah, yeah. all the bands that we that were supposed to then be that next, you know, to sort of carry it over. Um, it was they, a failure. They weren't there. No, and that's why we didn't yeah, see that, that happen again for years, and up until I would say, um, huh, I know Four Year had Four Year Strong had a major label release. It yeah. didn't do yeah. particularly great. And then I noticed that four years strong and I don't know these guys, they're a great band. Um, so I'm not in any way knocking them, but I also then noticed that they reverted to a certain sound. And, uh-huh. and I, again, what would I, I would do the same thing. My point is, is that we, you, you know, we went from seeing a bunch of bands that were supposed to sort of carry us over to the next realm. It didn't quite work. Then we saw a much smaller sample size and yet again, it didn't work. So the only real test of time, since like a fallout boy has been all time low o- outside of that who yeah. by the way sweet fucking people they let us open up for um for their the show had already sold out before they even posted the opening band they let us uh us and with the punches open for them in buffalo new york um this is eight years ago but again they could have picked you know their their, their, their little cousin could have done like a, a stand-up comedy bit yeah, he yeah. could open the show. Yeah. Fine. Well, something um, that also happened, though, uh, is that the industry kind of changed where, like, by that point, like, major labels, you know, like, they weren't going to play this on the radio anyway, right? Like, this kind of music, you know, because it was all, like, Bruno Mars and Beyonce or whatever. And, like, pop music had completely 
you know, like written off like, like you know, like guitar based rock music, you know, by sure. then. Yeah. So, but the, but, but on the plus side, I guess is like the, the, like there were, there were plenty of like indies that they could, that you could sign to and kind of climb to the top of that mountain. Right. And just kind of stay in that lane. So a lot of these bands didn't need to kind of like, you know, uh, change their set, to like write a pop song, right. You know, to like get, get on the radio or whatever. Like there wasn't even a, like, like wasn't going to happen. So that kind of like also kind of changed the thing. And that's part of the reason why there wasn't another wave really that like made it because that Avenue was cut off by then, you know, like they weren't looking for that, you know, I talk about with people like how just like weird it is just like think back. Like I remember when I was like 10, 11 years old, like watching the VMAs. Right. And uh, like Pearl Jam it, it is like performing like Metallica's perf- like the black album had just come out <laughs> and like they're on MTV yeah. and they're getting like promoted and stuff. Can you even conceive it? Like you can't, that's literally not even possible now. There's it's just like no Dave Grohl is the only yeah. Dave yeah. Grohl's the only Dave, last yeah. musician now. <laughs> that's, I said that to somebody else that, ever, that, that that I talked to. Like apparently Dave Grohl's the only like person who plays that like the only like rock musician now. I guess like you, you, you know yeah. if you just like watch watch CBS you know like full time like that's like all you would think of as like a rock star is like Dave Grohl's the only one, um, and it's it's. It's weird. He must be busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, I think it's pure. It's totally just like a, like a decision. Like it's not like people don't, wouldn't want to hear it. I do think that I tell the story too. Um, I went, uh, you're that there's a band called Billy talent from Canada. Mm-hmm. You heard of them? Sure. Um, yeah. And, uh, I'm like, a, I, like uh, my friend and I are like huge Billy talent fans. And so like we went to Canada a few years ago to go see them in Vancouver. And, uh, this band called like the dirty nil open for them. Um, sure. and they, they basically kind of sound like AC, like, well, no, not ACDC, but they kind of sound just kind of like traditional rock and roll, right? Like, like, like traditional rock music that you might've heard in like the nineties. I don't want to say new metal because it's not like new metal, but basically sort of like, right. Like yarling, uh, like, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. Butt rock, you know, (laughs) kind of butt rock, but they weren't bad. Right. Um, and I remember looking around and thinking like, it really did. Like, even if you do that well now, um, it's kind of like, we definitely have, I do feel, moved past like people like people don't want to hear that anymore like in sure. like in mass right like they don't want to hear that anymore and there are certain types of music that like over the course of history you can look back and like people just don't want to hear it like a large number of people just don't want to hear that anymore right um yeah you could argue that happened for ska right like um like after their you know uh like time in the in the limelight um I'll say yes. I'll say yes and no to that, though. Just on the grounds that when when everything finally dies, right? Mm-hmm. When ska's dead, when pop punk is dead, and then uh, a band gets together and starts, a new band gets together and starts doing it, mm-hmm. and they're good at it, then you know they're doing it for the reason uh, yeah, that they're loyal sure. to the genre, that they're a fan. Of. I guess I can let Drew in here. Hey, uh, I guess so. So, Drew, was it me? So, uh, did Mr. I do it, Mr. Kant? Did you, did you know every time you bop your little phone there, I gotta, I gotta move all the graphics around on my post production. I no, I'm sorry. <laughs> was I, 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 I had it set the whole time. I don't know. It, what, did you get a telemarketing call? No, it said it was disconnected. It said it was you. Yeah. Me and Kyle had a fine conversation. Oh man, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I don't really care. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's fine. Uh, um, so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, 
Go ahead. So my conversation, Drew, or, or I guess my statement, Drew, is that uh, let's say, you know, Ska completely dies, right? Ska's dead. And then Be Like Max, I'll plug them. They're my buddies. Be Like Max puts out an excellent fucking Ska record a couple years ago. They're doing it for all the right reasons. They're loyal to their genre. They're talented. They're nerds. They like to practice, which you brought up. They put out this perfect Big practice record. guy. Uh, yeah. Like no, and now suddenly there's this amazing record. And it's not, uh, it's not oversaturated with like all of these kind of shitty ska bands. I think that that can be really good for a genre, and I think that that's something sure. that might become relevant in pop punk uh, as we reach uh, another decade of it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, like it's it's but, happened. Well, like, like one thing, and I think it's just because of the nature of it, you know, uh, like hardcore, right? Has like never. Hardcore is just exi- it's it's never gone away. It's like it's it's just been the kind of its own scene um, since the eighties, right? Uh, yeah. So and it's 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 going strong. There's like new hardcore bands every year, and it's like it doesn't really. It's funny how there are bands that kind of like try to push it, and it like you know, Touche Amore is one example of a band that like tries to kind of like uh evolve the sound a little more and like do new things but you know what a lot of but like people who like hardcore just like they don't really you know i feel like they don't really care like they're they're totally fine if every new band (laughs) that comes up like just does the same thing and 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 they get to go there and just like go nuts for like an hour like that's what they want right and like they want to just like scream and like just fucking like thrash around um and that's kind of what it's about, uh, you know. Like it's, like, is is there an inherent embarrassment of liking pop punk? I, uh, so it it, it poses the question, like, right? So because I, I you know, the, the realm that we're discussing is again more of the pop than the punk. Uh-huh. And when we talk about more of the, you know, so it's hardcore punk, right? So whether we're talking yeah. Bad Brains or Chromags, you know, late seventies, early eighties. There was like a cool, like, oh uh, yeah, yeah, man. Like I was, I was at CBGBs, you know. There was, there was a cool yeah. factor to that. So, or like Civ or Gorilla Biscuits, sure. like any but of those so things. Yeah, for sure. What, what is that for? For pop punk, right? It, it's certainly not Warped Tour, you know. And I think that 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 kind of speaks volumes to the the overall participation. You know, I love that we're getting in yeah. depth about like about this top, but. Yeah, I mean, there's not, like, a cool thing. So, like, nowadays, I like, go into this is hardcore, and I've seen it. You know, I've seen, like, to kids, this is, like, a big, it's a big fucking cool deal. Um, whereas words were for our peers, let's not lie about it. Like, it was a laugh for a lot of folks our age that had common, uh, you know, even though we might have enjoyed it, people that like similar music to us were still kind of looking at Warp's cockeyed. Um, and, I, yeah, I, I guess I, yeah. Just, I can't help but wonder why... You know, why is pop, and I know why, it's because pop punk resides more on the pop side, um, whereas, you know, again, we've we've appreciated hardcore as like this. Yeah, man, hardcore is cool. I'm like, I'm not saying that it's not. But like, why is pop punk so not cool? You know, so this, well, you know, I'll, I'll segue, this up in my I'll segue that with. Uh, I meet my therapist on Wednesdays. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I'll, I'll segue this into that, that question that I had asked you previously. Uh, before the interview, but, uh, and this is coming from a guy who, you know, I got, I got emails and MySpace messages on, on DIY tours the day before a show that just said, Oh, just found out your band's pop punks are canceling your show. Cause we don't like mascara, you know? And I was like, we sound like no use for a name. Sick. <laughs> yeah. Like, so I, I'll, I'll say this, like there are a lot of cliches that exist in pop punk. And I think it's really easy to ruin a pop punk band. And just off the top of my head, nasally singing, singing about girlfriends and best friends moving away, using the word memories. Seven times of well, the 2010 yeah, home, the word hometown. <laughs> and, but, you know, and I think that's why you like this mic though, because like we didn't do the, that got, I hate my hometown and I'm moving. That was yeah. not our thing. And so, and so I'll, 
I'll, I'll take this in a more positive direction and we're going to talk about uh, what makes pop punk music really great and really timeless. And someone that's not you by all, I call fives is, is one of, uh, is one of these songs for me where I can listen to it and find, I can like pick and choose as a songwriter, as a musician, as a fan, I can pick and choose, uh, you know, five or six places on the song where I'm like, Oh my God, like Fall Out Boy Blue Album call out uh, where the drums pick up in a double time for a moment. What makes a pop punk song really, really magnificent? Uh, and I asked you guys to pick a couple. I'm going to start with actually uh, the newer of the two songs that I had, uh, which a lot of people don't talk about because it was later in their, in their discography, but All Time Low uh, – has a song called heroes i think it's on the album dirty work and it's near the end of the album i've asked the uh, i've asked the band in person if they've ever played this song live and of course the answer is no they've never even played the song live because at this point they were really digging in you know radio pop uh but this song has everything you can imagine out of a good pop punk song it has cymbal catches uh quick tom kick work into double time into jumpy guitar parts uh I mean, it's, it's like six different layers of pop punk in one song. Uh, and it's fantastic. I, I don't know if either of you have heard that song, uh, but I would recommend you listen yeah, to I, it. You and, know, I, don't, Kyle, I, I don't like pop, pop punk. You know, I like the punk stuff. You know, fuck all that. Yeah, punk. I like pop more punk. like basically like skate punk. If like you're talking about me, like pop punk to me means more like more like skate punk, I guess, is like more like pop punk to me. I don't know. I think if you listen to this song, you'd be surprised. Uh, yeah. It sound, To me, it sounds like a, a punk band that really likes punk music that's able to skate just one song past the producer that's saying, all right, guys, mm -hmm. we need to pick it up here. We need to sell records. And that yeah. song in particular means a lot to me because of that. Uh, but I'll move to you, Kyle. Did you have a song that kind of shapes pop punk for you? I mean, I mean, Hit or Miss was the first thing that came to mind as the like quintessential from like not only from just the sound because it uh there's almost kind of like like the breakdown in it is almost like a hardcore breakdown but like with singing with, 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 with like yeah. melody right um and it's just like cool it's catchy the lyric you know it's quotable tell us about the video the, the video um the garage door yeah the like weird clown thing uh yeah yeah they, the 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 like pro, like i don't know who that guy is the like promoter i guess is like you know like, like the, the guy in the office you know who's like freaking out he's 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 the promoter right like like <laughs> like they're late for the show um but also just like the way that um uh i i i think about american pie 2 you know, because that song was in American Pie 2 and like the shot of them, like the slow walk, which is like kind of like a staple of like teen movies, like at the time, um, like the slow walk of all of them, like da -da 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 right, like we're going back to the party or whatever. And how like that's the, the like the like how that kind of like cemented it in the like the culture, like the youth culture, right? Like that kind of music. No, and I agree. I think I think that, and I think that that's kind of a yeah. double-edged sword. That's where uh, us being the age that we are, are always going to hear that song and think about how cool that is. Mm -hmm. But a critic or a, a cynic is going to say that song just makes me think about a bunch of high school kids at an imaginary party in a movie that's not possible in real life. Yeah, but I definitely think that <laughs> when you put it like that, the the era that that I'm covering in the doc though, it got kind of unfairly uh labeled as like stupid or like childish you know uh like the content but if you actually go back and like listen to i mean not not every song but like a lot of songs i mean there was like some real like especially the lyricism was like very good <laughs> like especially for yeah. you know, some of these kids who were like you know 17 years old writing these songs or whatever like chris conley for example i mean there's there's no like 17 year old artist that you hear now that's writing anything that, that you hear about you know i'll say that uh like that like that makes it out into the the general public 
that's even that's sniffing anywhere near that sort of uh you know uh like that level of lyricism and just like the like the the feeling there's there's just something like intangible about it and to get back to what you're saying about like when people start to turn on it i think it's it's just frankly when um basically one of those things where like the where like people just stopped just like that kind of intangible thing that you can perceive when people are just writing lyrics like throwaway lyrics that like aren't that that don't mean anything like boys like girls yeah. like covers i'm i'm picking on uh good charlotte now but uh <laughs> that right you know what I'm kyle, talking about? kyle to be fair i literally said that was my band 10 years ago so you can yeah. name any band and i still lose this conversation <laughs> but Asian. you know i mean there were definitely bands i remember being uh even even at the time i remember uh there were definitely like that group of bands that were like serious and like you know cool and then the group of bands that were just like i don't know posers i guess you know would be the term maybe now but um because like by that because even by then like sellout was already kind of you know not not really a thing anymore um and that's totally gone now but uh it wasn't so much about that it was like the like the authenticity that you know and that's a perfect just word, that yes. thing just that just that thing that you could perceive like why they're writing this song you know what i mean and like when that and like you could tell like kids like kids can tell that you know what i mean and when you're writing like a pop song to like play at a party it, it doesn't matter right but if you're writing this type of music like it like it matters because of the tradition of like punk and hardcore music and even if you want to, you know, even like indie music, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, like that kind of thing matters to people who actually want to hear like a, a meaningful song. You know what I mean? So like when it started yeah. to become just kind of, you know, like kind of throw away, I hear this on the radio, like, you know, like number five on the hot, hot 20 countdown or whatever this week, people are like, Mamba number five. Yeah, <laughs> no, but no, I like I, I like that word authenticity though because I think that that's uh, that's really what gives a good pop punk song staying power in the first place. So I think that yeah. you know the numbers that we would bring up in this type of a, a top list, uh, what's keeping it there, what's keeping hit or miss there is authenticity. Is uh, you know maybe people can identify with this song, but the song was written with some thought behind it and a little bit of heart behind it. Yeah. And uh, Drew, we'll move to your song. Uh, well, I want to fact check myself. I think it was Better Off Dead that they did the the garage door opening when they all jump. Oh, you're Either right. Either way, yeah. I, don't, I don't think, yeah, okay. So I, I just want to make sure. I do have a newfound glory tattoo and I was, so I met, um, I met Steve on, we played uh, 2012 War Tour. And I, I, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> overly fan like fan guy, but I saw him like walking, yeah. you know, amongst the crowd. Um, and I was in my my friend that sold merch for us. I was like, get just get him a CD, just get it to him. I was like, what do you want me to do? I was like, just walk up to him, give him a fucking CD. Um, but so that was the band for me that was always a big deal. Um, but so no, this the question in terms of the song. Uh, there's two answers. I'm going to give a quick one and I'm going to give the one that I, I, I'm supposed to give. So the quick one though, for me, though, is uh, let go by Midtown. Um, that they did the, the, the road rules, real world, uh, yeah. the challenge it, that yeah. honestly, so that came out in 02. I was almost 14. Like that was like, I knew blank, I knew green day, but like, that's, that's why I bought a Midtown record. Um, mm -hmm. and that changed a whole lot of dynamics for me, but, the actual answer I'm going to give is, um, so I call five, uh, we're recording this weekend. We're recording, uh, in, in, in the spirit of the 20 year anniversary for stay what you are, we're, uh, we're recording, uh, at your funeral. So we're, we're heading to the studio with, uh, Kennedy from the wonder years is on drums. Casey from the wonder years is, uh, is producing it. And we're doing a new song and we're doing the saves the day cover. So of course cool. I choose that song, but, Speaking of that song, though, I, I, I still remember, I want to say it was Craig Kilborn in like yeah, 02. Okay. And I remember just being like, oh my God, like this is, 
this is a big deal. Um, it's a, it's, you know, it, it's the elk of band that I like and not to mention like the bass player is phenomenal. I am nowhere. And that's the irony is we're playing a song that has a Evan. great bass player for that record. Yeah. Um, I go fives doesn't have a great bass player. So I've been really trying my, <laughs> I've, I've played more bass in the last two months than I've played honestly in my whole life. Um, but no, like seeing that back then as like a 13 year old, that was, that was a huge deal. Um, it wasn't because part of that, it was literally anything I could just not Google or YouTube at the time, whatever. However, I was finding media. Um, it was like, who was in American pie too, you know? Mm-hmm. So to see that like on late night, um, it was, it was a big deal. And, uh, and at your funeral. Yeah. So that's, it's a song that, uh, it meant a lot to, to a bunch of us. Actually, one of the dudes covered it, um, in eighth grade at the, uh, at the talent show at our middle school. So it really goes across the board, but, um, but yes, that's, that's my pick. You know, what's funny about that? No, and I'm go ahead. No, go for it. You know, what's funny about that? Like how you just described that. Um, it's funny just how, like it how much it matters, like how old you, like in some senses. Okay. So for me, uh, I, cause I remember that when they were on TV, like my friend, um, told me, he was like, dude, this day is going to be on like Craig Kilborn. Right. And I remember like watching it. I don't, I don't know if I watched it like live or, or whatever. I mean, I guess I, or if I just like saw a clip later on YouTube, but that would have been like years later though. I don't know. Um, but like that kind of thing, it's funny for like, for like this group of bands, um, or like if I put on like MTV two was, was like another one where like these bands could, 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 could get out. Like it, like it was an outlet for them to like, you know, like it's the end of an era. outlet. Yeah. Yeah. It was a big deal. Uh, yeah. Like Thursday was big on there. I remember. Um, and, uh, the video for uh, for Freakish, I remember like being on MTV Two. You name Dashboard. it, it was there. Yeah, Dashboard was all over MTV Two, and I remember thinking it's funny, like to someone who was younger and yourself, it's it's like weird how like seeing that like really meant something to you, but to me that like meant nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's like, funny. Sure, because I had already seen them in like the gymnasium at like massachusetts institute of art or whatever right sure. like a few years before that um and well, when you uh, said kyle, this kyle, kyle you said it's just weird hmm? so you're an old man kyle. you said you're 38 I'm right kyle. Um, yeah. i'm yeah, a young fresh i'm 30 no 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 see i shouldn't even be able to hear, like my ears shouldn't pick up your your very uh elder tones i'm a young <laughs> 32 year old so yeah no but you when you think about it like the five yeah, so 38 year, 36 and 32 it's a massive difference. uh when we're talking about this particular this particular movement of music like mm-hmm. yeah six years is for fucking ever i mean yeah. like kings of pop came out like the month that I moved away from my parents' house and moved to Lincoln, Nebraska, right? So that was like the mm-hmm. soundtrack the whole time. Uh, as I was establishing my first job in Lincoln and trying to score 200 bucks so I could live another month. Uh, when, you, when you say score, when, uh, it sounds like it was a drug effort. Don't use score anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you just needed 200 bucks. Uh, have you ever seen that... Uh, that Leonardo DiCaprio movie. That movie that's called? what I read. Yeah. Yeah. It's no, just Irish? like that. That was my life. That was my life. Because yeah. uh, you like, said like, score. It's just funny. But like, it's just but funny I, how just, like, how just being a certain age and like, um, how like you drew like experience those bands in like such a different way. Like, like, yeah. than I did. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's um, and that's why again I like weird. it though to the eighties hair metal. Like imagine yeah. being a new eighties hair metal band in nineteen eighty nine. Because right. come nineteen ninety two, you're like, Oh my god, what what did we do? I <laughs> dropped out of college for this shit. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's wild. Um and Mike, I never intended to say I have to cut out early. I have to cut out early. I have delayed the South Park new episode for an hour. And I'm going to get to very angry. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. Drew, Drew Conti from I Call Fives. Kill me. They're recording some new music here soon. Yeah, and dude, thank you so much. And Kyle, it was a pleasure meeting you. Uh, Mike, yeah, 
I've known you were okay for, for eight years now. Um, but now, and again, you know, what you're doing, that's, it's just a cool doc. I, I look forward to seeing it. And Mike, th again, thanks. Thanks for booking us. Thanks for having us. You sucker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess Tell I Jeff, I'm thinking about his balls. Hey, that's for another discussion. <laughs> that's that's for another zoo later. <laughs> All right, bye, guys. All right, later. All right, so uh, we'll we'll talk to Jeff Todd from My Call Fives about his vasectomy that he got today, uh, and why he wasn't joining us for the interview. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll also Over review the uh, we'll review the new South Park special that I'm also excited to watch tonight. Uh, in closing, Kyle, I wanted to talk about. Uh, when the documentary is going to be done, I know that you're actively working on it right now. Yeah. Uh, do you have a deadline or are you just getting as many artists as you can? I don't have a deadline, uh, which is good and bad. Uh, it's good because, uh, you know, because of what's going on right now. Um, and basically at this point I'm, I'm like a stay at home dad basically. <laughs> so I don't have a ton of time. Um, and at this point I'm like, anything I do is like self-funding. So that's another thing too. So, uh, I'm definitely, uh, kind of like, you know, like dinking and ducking here and there when I can. But, um, I thankfully was able to get, you know, I certainly have enough interviews, uh, like without quite, like I have like 60 interviews. So I have like enough interviews to make something for sure. And I've been working on just, uh, I've been, I've been working on it, but, um, definitely don't have like an imminent like release date or anything like that. Um, I'm still kind of working through like getting archival, which has been, been like a little bit like harder than I expected, which is kind of, kind of strange. Um, you, you know, like videos and like old photos and stuff like that, just to, just to like get people actually to like send them to me, <laughs> like to, to, to like physically to, like actually do it. Um, Cause I've talked to people like, Oh yeah, sure. I got plenty of stuff. And then I'm here for them for like months. Um, well, it's a strange but, era, uh, you know, uh, Disposable cameras well, yeah. became obsolete during that time period, and uh, digital cameras were all uploaded to uh, like photo buckets and MySpace accounts that are gone. <laughs> right. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Like it's funny. Like it definitely is. Uh, I mean, obviously, like computers, the internet existed, right? But it was definitely pre, like, just the like ubiquity of it, right? So like, you know, like, it's not like everybody has a billion pictures now. Like, you know, I mean, if I put on a call now on like the Instagram page, like, Hey, you know, anybody who has, has picture, has like pictures from the like census fail tour last year, like send them to me, I'd get like a billion things like immediately. But if I'm like, yeah. does anybody have any pictures of like, or like video of like census fail playing the Wayne firehouse in in like 2001, <laughs> you know, or whatever. Um, yeah. That's a different story. Uh, so I got to work through that. And, uh, I also just like, I've, it probably would have been easier if I decided to like really focus on just like one, like New Jersey, right. Or like Long Island or whatever. Uh, it definitely would have been easier to kind of like craft and, and like wrap my head around it or whatever. So I'm, 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 I'm still kind of like, I have, a plan but i'm still kind of like crafting how to get like everything in there and like how to organize it so it all makes sense like it like in a narrative yeah. you know because i want it to be more like a narrative type of, of 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 style um versus just like a i don't know i don't want it to be too uh i don't know the term i'm I want to, I don't want to say basic because <laughs> that's insulting to people who do docs this way, but just like, I don't want it to be just like picture interview, picture interview, like completely chronological, like, you, you know, uh, kind of, um, or just like broken up into like very specific. I don't want it to be like too, uh, I want the structure. I want it to be more of like, like, I'm like weaving the story versus um, like laying out a fence. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. I want to like, yeah, I spoke to, uh, I spoke to Ludwig, uh, Lud Ludwig Gurr is the, he was the director of that new Tony Hawk documentary. Yeah. And uh, he was one of my first guests in this uh, season two of who's zoom and who he, uh, 
he set out to make a video game documentary and mm -hmm. uh, walked away with like a skating documentary that mm -hmm. talked about a video game, which we, we talked about a bit because it's an, it's an amazing documentary because of the, that uh, very last minute decision to, to produce it the way that it's produced and narrate it the way it's narrated. So uh, I understand this is your baby. So it's going to come out when it's perfect and we're all looking forward to it. Yeah. Uh, I so I wanted to thank you for your time. <laughs> oh, well, thanks for having me on. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm available. <laughs> I got free time these days, so it's good to talk yeah. about it and we just want to get people remind them it's still going on. I definitely don't, I definitely don't want to be, um, and this isn't like an uncommon thing at all. Like there's like infamous stories about like documentaries take like, you know, I mean that, that like the bulls documentary, they've been like, they started that in like 20 years ago or whatever, you know? So, or, yes. or 10 or like 10 years ago, maybe like, you know, like they started kind of like compiling things and, and working on it. So I, I don't want to do that, but um, I'm definitely not going to like rush it just to make something just because, you know, you know, so people don't like forget it, you know, like about it. And then uh, I make something that's like not that, that great or like not that profound, you know, cause I still, I want to give these, these bands like their due and the documentary that they deserve. Um, and, you know, also just, there are, it's funny, like somebody interviewed uh, Jonah Bayer. He's a, like a, a, a journalist, music journalist, and he's a musician too. And he's, he's in, he's been in some bands. He was in a band with Jeff Rickley, uh, United Nations, which is like a hardcore band. And uh, yeah. um, he said something about like, yeah, like it was weird, you know, I mean, they obviously like all these bands, uh, like the scene collectively, I mean, it's like, you can't say that like it didn't like go mainstream. Uh, but he's like, but like, it never really felt like it was mainstream. Like for those bands for like that, like that first, first push of, of bands, um, like the save the day Thursday, like Midtown. Right. Um, like newfound glory even. Uh, and it's like, I know what he's saying because I meet people who are my age, uh, I've, I've met a ton of people my, and this is one of the, like, one of the, like, impetuses, I guess, uh, for, like, doing this, um, was I would meet people who were my age, just kind of, like, socially out, you know, and, uh, you know, like, as an adult, <laughs> like, after I moved to LA, and they had no idea, like, like, who I was talking about, you know, or, yeah. you know, or they, you know, or they'd be like, oh, it's like, oh, like, oh, like, Blink, what are you too? And I'm like, no <laughs> right um yeah, yeah because that's that's all like they know them and they know like green day and then they know like good charlotte or whatever and that like that's pretty much it um and uh so i you know i mean it's like and there hasn't really been there hasn't been a documentary just like about this specific era there's there's like it's weird there's like been a punk documentary basically about there's there's been a there's been a lot of them about you know like the 80s you know, like, you know, like hardcore mm -hmm. and stuff. And then even like the late eighties, early nineties. And then there's been like a fat rec doc. Um, yeah. but there hasn't been a doc about like this, this, like this, this little pod. Um, so I'm trying to make it. And, uh, I'm definitely like, we're in that window, like that, like 20 ish year window, um, for like a lot of the like landmark albums and stuff like that. So, uh, I don't want to take too long, but, I just got to get my ass in gear or coronavirus needs to just go away so that my kids can go back to school, <laughs> like actually yeah, school. And I don't have to yeah. teach them all day. <laughs> yeah. Mine, mine's not old enough to teach, but she's definitely old enough to uh, tell me to stop doing what I'm doing and watch frozen with her. So I, I get it. Mm. So thanks. Thanks a lot, Kyle. I appreciate you taking the time out. Uh, the last scene documentary, look out for it, follow it on Instagram. Uh, I'll yeah. put it in the comments here. Uh, otherwise, thank you again for your your time. Uh, Drew, wherever you are, if you're enjoying your South Park, uh, and I'm looking yeah. forward to new I Call Fives when it comes out. And, uh, yeah, thanks a lot, man. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mike. See you later.